So a topic I've been thinking about for some time and had a hard time kind of digesting and coming down to how how do you do this, what am I thinking kind of thing, you know, um, starts here. And basically wondering about how do we get the approval of God for the things that we're doing? How do we know um, what God wants us to do? And that is usually referred to as authority. A person has to be authorized or being given um, or delegated the authority to do a thing. Eh, that's reasonable. Um, but really it comes down to how do you know the difference between right and wrong? How do you know what it is that God wants from you? And how do we know what it is that God wants from us uh, in general? So that's something I've been thinking about for a long time and trying to figure out how to put those thoughts together. And this lesson is my first attempt <laughs> at addressing this topic um, at this time. So let's get started with that. And you know, in all of the study, I guess, and all of the, the looking and thinking about what is contained in the Bible on this topic, I come first to Proverbs um, chapter 1, because the beginning in verse 7, the beginning of knowledge is the fear of the Lord. So if I'm asking, how do I know um, or even what do I know? Um, it's It starts with the fear of the Lord. Where fools despise wisdom and instruction. Despise doesn't mean hate. It means undervalue. Um, you know, it's, it's not the most important thing. It's... it's uh, um, a secondary consideration or an afterthought or something is what despise actually means. It's not important, not the most important, um, deprioritized, undervalued, you know, something like this. And that's true. Wisdom and instruction don't have the proper place with those who God calls fools. They should be, wisdom and instruction should be more important. But you know, the important thing, I think, in the first couplet, or in the first line of this couplet, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. It tells me that the whole question of how do I know has to be informed by caring what God wants in the first place. I mean, that's what it is. What, it, what this means is, do, you, do I even care what it is that God wants? <laughs> is, is it God that... I'm trying to serve and God that I'm trying to please and if so then knowledge begins um, you know, this is talking about spiritual knowledge obviously it's not ABC 123 knowledge it's spiritual knowledge that starts with fear of God caring what God wants is the way I would look at that do we care what it is that God wants in this place um, a lot of people talk about, and there was a, well, I say recent, I'm getting old, I guess, but there was a, a public campaign a while back by the atheists um, called Good Without God. They wanted to say they were doing good and they didn't need God to do good. And it was, of course, charitable works and uh, charitable organizations doing things like feeding people, clothing, these kinds of things. And it's true that you can do those kinds of good um, which would fall under the category of love your neighbor. But you can't do that to the exclusion of love the Lord your God. And that's the thing that they're asserting is you really only need one of the two great commandments. Love your neighbor. Loving God is just not important. What God wants just doesn't matter. That's just a, you know, organized religion. That's just a preacher fuss. Uh, those are just details. Right, all the things that people say to kind of basically that all rolls up into one thing, which is, I don't care what God wants. <laughs> I don't care what God says. 
I'm not trying to make God happy. I'm only trying to make people happy, those that I can see around me. Right? And that's, well, that's basically atheism, whether they profess to believe in God or not. That's basically atheism. The true knowledge starts with fear of the Lord. Do you want to know what the Lord wants? Do you want to know what God desires? It has to start there. If you don't care what God wants you to do, if you have no reverence or respect for God and his authority, then how are you going to know anything? Why are you going to know anything? It doesn't it doesn't make sense, and that's why I think this is the first thing. It starts, um, you know, it, it's, it starts with fear God um, there in Proverbs 1. Uh, so that has to be said. I can't just skip that. You know, that we got to make that clear that it matters what God wants. And if that matters to you, then you want to know how to know what God wants. And the next thing I would point to is God gets to set the terms. Um, and we, we really have to accept those terms. God has chosen a method. He's, he has chosen a way to let us know what he wants. And we have to accept that way. Um, we could talk about this. A little bit more here so I would go back to Genesis looking back at the creation you can see an argument if you will that begins there a philosophical argument I mean rhetorical argument that begins in Genesis when God said at verse 3 let there be light and there was this is the way that God made everything in Genesis 1 if you keep going through the verses and you see how he made uh, night, you know, light, he separated day from night, he made the land, he made the animals, he made the pupils, all of this stuff was done by, and God said, let there be. <laughs> His method of creating was to say, let there be. That's his chosen method. He could have used his hands to mold things. He could have any number of things, right? Because he's God. He has the ability to do anything. He created everything that we see today out of nothing. In other words, he spoke it into existence. It wasn't. And then he said, let there be, and it was. And that's how he chose to do it. And John 1 picks this up, the Gospel of John, the, the opening verses of the Gospel realize that this is so and call attention to it. At verse 1, in the beginning was the Word. Because it said in the beginning when God created the heavens and the earth at Genesis 1.1. So in John 1.1, 1, 1, he says in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. All things were made through the word, verse 3 continues. And without him was not anything made that was made. What, you know, what is John saying? What John is saying is that God chose to use words to create everything. That's all that John is getting at. The, the, the speech of God, the word, you know, let there be light is effectively God. The word, the, the, the word was in the beginning. It was with God. It was God. Everything was made through that word. Without the word was not anything made that was made. Meaning no created thing came into being that wasn't spoken into being. He used his word to create it. And we refer back to Isaiah in the 55th chapter, which I understand in its context is saying that God will bring about the, the salvation, the forgiveness, 
the reclamation of his people from foreign lands. I get that, but the principle stands from the 10th through the 11th verses that the way in which he did that was his word through his prophets. The 10th verse of Isaiah 55 is the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return there but water the earth, making it bring forth and sprout, giving seed to the sower, bread to the eater. So shall my word be that goes out from my mouth. It also will not return to me empty. It will accomplish what I purpose. It will succeed in the thing for which I sent it. It's telling us, you know, if you go back to the 10th verse, this is in elementary school, they call that the water cycle, right? <laughs> the rain and the snow come down from the sky, from heaven. True. And uh, they don't return there. It doesn't stay in the sky and then go whoop, back up into the sky. <laughs> it doesn't go from cloud to cloud. It comes down to earth, out of heaven, out of the sky. They don't return there. They water the earth. And it's transformed, too, from those clouds into rain or snow in some way. And snow itself is transformed when it hits the ground into water. Water, then, travels on earth. Water, water, it waters the earth. It makes the earth bring forth and sprout, meaning th this is where all of the plants get their water from. Giving seed to the sower, bread <coughs> to the eater. The point of this is that there's a whole chain of events, including, you know, both natural events and human events. It starts in heaven in this, what you and I would call a gaseous form, but becomes what we would call precipitation, whether snow or rain. It hits the earth, eventually becoming water. The water travels through the earth where the plants drink it up. And they use this together with the sun to bring forth and to sprout. This is where our grains come from. It's where our fruits come from. The water that is contained within those plants, those trees, those fruits, you know, eventually came from the clouds in the sky. And that water generates the seed. The seed is, you know, harvested by man. Ah, uh, birds eat it too. But man harvests the seed and uses the seed, works the seed to make things with it. For example, bread. There's seed that can be sown that will make more seeds. There is seed that is used to make bread, to feed people. So people have their nourishment, they have their living from it. And it all traces back to this water vapor, this gaseous form of water in the sky that eventually makes its way to becoming our nourishment. That's the point. You see that cycle. And like I said, in elementary school, you learn about the water cycle to a certain point. But the scripture goes a little farther, pointing out that it is that water that gives us crops, that gives us the ability to make more crops, as well as giving us the nourishment, the food that we eat. In the same way, the word leaves his mouth, meaning it leaves heaven in a state that is not understood by us, if you will. But he said in the same way that the water or the rain leaves heaven and doesn't go, come immediately back, but it goes through a whole cycle accomplishing the nourishment of mankind, <laughs> his word will do the same thing. It will leave heaven and won't bounce back to sender. It will go 
It will hit the earth. It will spread. It will grow. It will nourish. That's what God's word will do. It won't return empty. It will accomplish what I purpose. It will succeed in the thing for which I sent it. God chose to use his word to accomplish his purpose. What he wants to get done is what's getting done by means of his word. It may be that there are things that we want to see done that his word does not accomplish. And, you know, this passage doesn't make any room for that. If his word does not accomplish it, it's not something that he wants. Because his word leaves his mouth and doesn't return empty. It accomplishes his purpose. If you don't find it in his word, then it's not what he purposes. That's fairly plain, I think. But it's also telling us something about the effectiveness of what he says. Um, the third passage to consider about God's chosen method is 2 Corinthians 4, where Paul admits that he and the rest of the apostles are just jars of clay, earthen vessels. You know, we're made out of dirt. <laughs> Which is good to remember when the children eat dirt in the garden. <laughs> Which they do from time to time. My mother told me plainly that Grandma's garden dirt was very sweet. I believe that that's true. Uh, they didn't use nearly the pesticides and things that we do today. It's a different matter. I'm not recommending that you try it, but you know. We're made out of dirt, and Paul recognizes that in 2 Corinthians 4, verses 5 down through 7, when he says, We are proclaiming, not ourselves, but Jesus as the Lord. We are playing the role of servants to you on behalf of Jesus. God, who said, let light shine out of darkness, has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. It is by means of this Jesus whom we now know. But this God, who said, let light shine out of darkness, when did he say that? It was Genesis 1-3. So the God who created the earth, as he said he did in Genesis 1, said, let light shine out of darkness. It's that same God who has also shown in our hearts, giving the light of the knowledge. It means that his word is the thing that shines his word is that shining light in us in our hearts but we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that the surpassing power the power to overcome belongs to god not to us so what we're getting at here is that god chose to use his word he chose to speak his word through people people made of dirt jars of clay the god who spoke light into existence in genesis 1 3 also has spoken christians into existence in the spirit you become a christian if you become a christian you do so by obedience to the word as revealed in the new testament and when you become a christian you become a child of god because of that same word you were created in Christ Jesus. So he spoke light into existence. He also gave the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in Christ in our hearts, which clearly means by the word that is being preached by these apostles. The fact that the apostles are jars of clay and we are jars of clay and yet his word still comes through and his word still has its effect of people obeying the gospel and living right before him, that fact glorifies him still more. Uh, rather than you know taking away from 
the power of God or taking away from the glory of God. Um, you know, you look at the the chosen, you know, the chosen vessels, say Paul, or any of the other apostles. They had their flaws. They had their troubles. That's what he means in jars of clay. Not that flesh is inherently sinful, but that we're less than perfect. But we're doing what God asks as a rule, and the power to overcome belongs to God, not to us. There's a treasure in the word of God. There's a treasure in the light of the knowledge of God that is being contained within us, though we are jars of clay. The fact that we are these jars of clay, but his word still shines through and we can still make right choices, glorifies him. And it glorifies him even more, I think, the fact that we're made of dirt. <laughs> but the light of God shines through us. So this is what we, um, you know, this is what we refer to, or what I refer to when I say, accept, accept God's chosen method. I mean, he chose to use his word to create. He chose to use his word to save. Um, he chose to use human beings to get his word across and to do his will on earth. That is his purpose, and he has promised that his purpose will be accomplished. And so we have to accept that he will communicate through his word. Um, John 7 is another thought, but continuing what we're talking about for the moment, we're, what we're getting at is that we read this to understand it. The reason is because, you know, the conclusion of, of God having chosen to get things across through his word is that he wrote it. He wrote the Bible. And his intent behind writing that Bible was that we could read that Bible and that we could accomplish his mission. That his word does not return to him empty. It comes down to earth and filters its way through the dirt to get to our souls. God wrote this Bible so that we would read it so that we would do what he wants. And that's the most important thing to understand. Um, it's his chosen method. It's his chosen way of doing, of accomplishing what he wants, of letting us know what he wants. And John 7 is a good example of this where Jesus is teaching in um, the temple and a question arises about how he learned to teach and where his teaching came from. And he told them, well, my teaching is not my own. It's his who sent me. It's from God. But the 17th verse is the important one for the moment. If anyone's will, Jesus said, is to do God's will. then he will know whether the teaching comes from God or whether I speak on my own authority. What we mean by this, what Jesus means by this, is that every teaching comes from somewhere. There's an authority implied behind any teaching. Is this teaching actually from God? Or is this teaching from some private human origin? How do you know? Well, you know when it is your will to do God's will. When you are trying to do what God wants you to do, then you can look at this teaching and you'll know whether that teaching comes from God or whether it comes from some private origin, some human source. 
this is the, the teaching of Jesus about it. it. The teaching of God can be recognized. The teaching of God can be known. But it's known when your will is to do God's will, which corresponds to Proverbs 1, that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. If you fear God, as in you, you want to please him, then you, you're, you seek his will. That's when you will to do his will. And if that's what you're trying to do, that is when you understand. Um, so I'm going to try to say it in different ways. <laughs> Another way of saying this is that when, therefore, we read the Bible for ourselves, to understand it, to do it, this is not an arrogant thing that we are doing. It's not self-reliance. Um, you know, like, well, I'm going to do this. I'm going to figure this out. I'm going to solve this great mystery. It, that's not, it, no, that's not what you're doing. You're just trying to listen to God. You're trying to go to the only source there is of God talking to us, telling us what he wants. That's not self-reliance. Reading to understand is not relying on your own ability or your own understanding. It's, it is trusting in God that what he said about his word not returning empty, his word accomplishing his purpose, our desire to do his will, giving us the ability to know the source, whether it's human or divine. Reading to understand is trusting the God who wrote it for us to read it to understand it. It's not about relying on yourself, it's about relying on God. Um, which, you know, another way of saying that is it's not really about our ability to understand. Because people sometimes get hung up on, well, I'm, you know, I'm, uh, uh, you know, fallible, I'm imperfect, I'm, you know, a jar of clay. Right. And that's, true but it's not really so much about the fact that i am fallible we're not looking for or touting our ability to understand god uh, to understand god's will although you can understand it obviously that's implied that's not the focus what it's really about is god's ability to make it understood it's not about how great I am because I can understand this. That's not the focus at all. And if you're thinking that way, your thinking is incorrect. That's not seeking God. That's not fearing God. The point of this is that God has the ability to make himself understood. He said he would give a word. He said his word would not return to him empty. It would accomplish exactly what he intended for it to. Did he lie when he said that? Was he wrong or mistaken when he said that? I don't think so. He clearly intended for this Bible to work, and it does. We can surely say it does. You can know the truth. You can be saved from your sins. But, you know, I want to, again, to center that idea, we are not trusting in ourselves. We're not trusting in our ability. We're trusting in God's ability. It isn't about, oh, I can understand it so well. It's about God can get it across to me. There's not a, a barrier here that God cannot cross. His arm is no, not so short that it cannot save. He can make himself understood. And uh, he has chosen to do so through his word. And yeah, there's a lot of other things like why don't people understand it? That's a different problem. It's not God's fault when people don't understand it. And there's maybe a lot of reasons why people don't understand. Some of those are things that can be overcome. Some of those are character flaws. But you get don't get lost in the weeds on that deal. People do lots of things but let, we're trying to focus on what god does and what god can do 
Can he get us a word that we can understand? Yes, he can. In fact, he said that he would do so. Does his word succeed at doing exactly what he wants it to do on earth today? I think so, yes. I think so. Those who fear God can be saved. Those who seek him will find him. You can, you can certainly make it to heaven. You can certainly know the truth about what God wants and requires of you. Because, not because you can, but because God can. It would reflect poorly on him if we could not understand his word, if it wasn't possible for us to get it. If he who created us and created our minds and our tongues could not communicate with us, that would reflect poorly on him, not on us. He can be understood, and he intends to be understood. He, he made it plain that that was what he had in mind when he spoke our entire world into existence, when he spoke light into our hearts in Christ Jesus. So to the question of how do you know, um, the answer is read to understand. You, you know from the Bible. Uh, and maybe somebody doesn't know how to read, but well, you can have it read to you. But it's coming from the Word. It's coming from the Bible. That's how you know. The Bible tells you what God wants. Um, so that's the first thing that we would say, is if you first have to care what God wants, you then have to accept his chosen methodology. He chose to use his Word. That word, he says, is very effective at doing what he intends. You either believe that or you don't. And it isn't about our abilities. He demonstrated that he could work through imperfect human jars of clay when he sent his word through the apostles especially. It's about his ability to save, and he certainly does have that. And we're very thankful that he's given us a word that saves, a word that we can understand. All right. So we do, when we come together, talk about obedience to that word. What does it contain? Well, in the Acts, in the second chapter, when the Lord was first proclaimed by the apostles, they said, Repent, every one of you, and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the Holy Spirit's gift. So all the words given breath by the Holy Breath or Spirit of God are aimed at you being baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for forgiveness of sins. These words grant to you the gift of salvation. If you believe that Jesus is the Son of God, that he is resurrected, then you too can be resurrected in the Spirit. You can put to death the old person of sin and be resurrected a new creation in Christ Jesus by means of Acts 2.38 and all the other things that are written about this because it is that word that creates you a new a new creature a new christian if today you need to obey the gospel we're happy to help you to do that there's water ready if today you are a christian who has not been living according to the principles we read here well think about these things if, if in something you have sinned repent and pray god for forgiveness if we can help you with our prayers on your behalf, we will do that very gladly. If you need our prayers, if you need to obey the gospel, let it be known by coming to the front here while we stand and sing the song selected. <laughs> 